Okay, well, people are continuing to come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the conservatory at the Barbican, our third great event. Lots of faces I recognise, lots of new faces to the community. I wanted to start by saying what a fabulous venue this is. The only disappointment so far is we've all been congregating in the coffee room, but we have the whole venue. So after the event, through the session as you're networking, please make use of the whole place. Um, there's some lovely greenery around there. There's bridges and, and seats and chairs. So the whole venue is yours for today. Please do make most of it. So firstly, welcome. Um, welcome to a fantastic event. Lots of change. Most of you are aware that lots are changing. And I'm going to start while people are coming up with a little bit about what's been happening in our world for the last 18 months. Because as you're aware, there are around 65 endorsing bodies at the moment. But in April, that goes down to three. Three endorsing bodies. The startup programme will close to new applicants. But all of you who are on it, that's absolutely fine. It will continue as normal. And there will be a single revised innovator programme from April onwards. So many, many changes. And we are extremely proud that we are one of the three endorsing bodies that will continue to deliver that service. Thank you very much. But that makes me very proud, thank you. But I want to be absolutely honest about that. The reason we won that contract is because of you lot. The support that you give us, the, the, the experience, the personality, everything you bring to the network, it is. So it's not us that's won it, it's you guys who have won it as well. So we want to thank you for helping us through that process. There'll be a couple of small changes for people on the new visa but they are only small changes. If you are on the new visa, and that includes people who progress from a startup to an innovator, they are removing the £50,000 restriction and replacing it with a sum to be deemed appropriate by the endorsing body. But also, if you are on the new visa, and I can answer these questions privately and later on, you will be able to do additional work as long as it's related to your innovation project. So let's say for the sake of argument, you've got a, um, a project in education, you can do consultancy in education, but you couldn't get a job in a shop or a different sector that's not related to your innovation project. So lots of changes, lots of exciting things. Now what amazes me most today is the feeling in the room. When we did the Dragon's Den, you want to quick show of hands, who was at the Dragon's Den with us? We've got a good handful of, 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 the, of the originals. Fantastic. The feeling was a feeling of excitement, of new adventure, of new entrepreneurs, then year two, when we did the Shard. Who was on the roof of the Shard? Fantastic. I'm so glad the weather held out that day. Um, we had some amazing stories. and There were stories of progress. But this year, we've got people who are in their third year. We're getting stories of um, new starts. We're getting stories of progress. We're getting st um, stories of achievement. And Karen said, because we're not having people on the stage this year, apart from Mark, why don't we give a few of the success stories and I said, fantastic, Karen. I said, scribble them down because I need to put them in big writing because my eyesight's terrible and I've not got my glasses. And she gave me five pages of A4. Five pages of success stories from all of you. So I'm, I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to just whip through a few of them very, very quickly. Um, I've not seen, is Justin here today? I've not seen Justin. No, Justin's not here, but Justin has landed a contract with the Ministry of Defence for his uh, flying drones. And for someone to come from outside the UK and land an MOD contract, is absolutely incredible. This is why I start to read quickly, because I've got a lot to go through. I'm only going to pick a few. Cy and Vamshi from Avalon have launched their security systems app, now available on Google Play Store. Um, growing rapidly, team and a line of partners vying to get involved. Dana passes on her apologies. Um, she's working abroad today and has been growing ancestors unknown. Who remembers Travis? Travis. Now, Nick is going to have to remind me. Where's Nick sat? Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you very much. So, Travis's client has just won a song for Serbia, which means he is going to be in the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, now, we know how eccentric Travis is. He will fit in perfectly there. Um, so, we'll all wish him luck there as well. Um, Tamara has now opened, Tea by Tamara, and apparently is absolutely fantastic. I've not had the opportunity to go there. Please do if you get the chance. Um, Vicky's transition to Innovator. Well done, and a lot of people have also transitioned to Innovator. I'm going to run down on these because I've got far too many to read out in total, but it's just a couple more. Anupam was crowned Business Leader of the Year at the Ascent Business Leader Awards for 2023. 
um, for the AI-powered platform to integrate testing and diagnostic solutions. Congratulations. Again, we see strength and strength. I'm connected to the LinkedIn for um, Julia and Sophia, and the progress is looking fantastic, and the artwork is superb. Absolutely superb in the gallery. Thank you very much. We're not going to put you on the spot this year, though, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'll just go through one more quickly. Um, Irfan, who's now successfully launched uh, local corporate research and investigation. Um, I keep saying this will be the last one, but I see more and more. Rezwana, we keep seeing Rezwana's work on, uh, on TV. It was on Sky TV the other day. Great interview about the, about the interior work. Fantastic it was. Um, so, <laughs> so can, I mean, I can't read them all. Congratulations to everyone. The progress is absolutely phenomenal, and you are what make this network successful. And long may, long may that continue. So today, we, there's one main role, and we want you to, one main objective, we want you to have fun. We want you to enjoy yourselves. We, there's not a business objective today. You will go away having learned some things, because I know how good our speaker is. Um, and on that note, I always felt it difficult to integrate with or to find other people who were innovative and creative, especially in, 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 in a bland corporate world. And I found one guy who was an innovation expert, did a lot of great stuff on LinkedIn. And we arranged to meet and we met for a coffee in Manchester Museum. And when he turned up, I knew we'd get on because he had a shirt as wacky as mine. And we found out we both had a great love for shirts. And ever since that day, we've got on like a house on fire. He's an amazing person. Um, he entertains from start to finish. So we said today, let's get Mark up here, entertaining you guys. So it's not going to be so much about Mark speaking. It's certainly not going to be about me speaking. I do enough of that anyway. It's going to be more about you doing things, you getting involved in some creation and some, uh, um, some, and some, some, some innovation, which is why you can see the pads and the pens on the table, of course. But bearing that in mind, I just want to, again, say after this event, after this session finishes at 3.30, please make use of the whole venue. Have a look around, take photos, but speak to people. Find someone who's doing something similar to you, something different to you, someone who comes from the same or a different country from you or who lives near or far away from you. And just, if you appreciate, when Nick and I set this up initially to do a little bit of work with people like you, and I look around and I think, the community on one table, sorry, the experience and knowledge on one table just dwarfs the knowledge that Nick and I have. So the only way you can help each other is by helping each other. So please do make contacts today. Thoroughly enjoy it. Have a great time. Do collar us if you have any questions, but appreciate uh, we're getting lots of questions. So uh, if there's something specific you'd like, you're probably better asking us over LinkedIn or email. Because otherwise, we sat on the train home trying to think what the 200 questions and things that we were asked for today. Um, so do enjoy it, but most importantly for now, because I'm eating into his time, can we please have a massive hand for Dr. Mark Beatty? Right, is it, yes, it's working as he comes into shot. Thank you very much, Richard. Good afternoon. How are we all doing? That was rubbish. Let's try again. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we all doing? Now, that's what we're talking about. Can we just like, before I say anything, just turn to the people on your left and right and behind you and say hello, because if you haven't done so already, let's say hello. So now you have no excuse that when I get you to do stuff, because I'm lazy, when I get you to do lots of things, you've now met one another, there's no excuse for not getting involved and trying some stuff out. So I'll say a little bit about myself in a minute, but probably framing what we're going to be doing, just as Richard has said, this is mainly about having fun, and if at the same time you accidentally learn some useful new stuff for a startup business or an innovator, well, hopefully we're going to do that as well. I said, I'm quite lazy, so you've got pads and pieces of paper in front of you, and I'm going to get you to try and invent a new product today in each of your new tables. Who knows, I will take a full license on anything you come up with. That's not true. But hopefully working together, you'll have some fun. And my objective is that tomorrow or next week, you'll have learned some things that you think, I could do that. That will be helpful for me to grow my business and to be more innovative. So I'll do a quick introduction to myself with words that are probably too small on the screen, so don't pay much attention to those. My name is Mark Beatty, and I tend to wear well, probably, honestly, three different hats. One of those hats isn't on here. I'm a father of three girls. 
I'm mad about cricket. I like paddle boarding and cooking and crazy shirts once in a while and even crazier shoes, if truth be told. That's not on the slide. I'm also a scientist. I'm a scientist and academic of creativity and innovation. Not many people realize you can do science of creativity and innovation, but I've studied what happens in your brain. I'm the first person to actually study neurodiversity and creativity in relation to things like autism, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia. There's actually lots of places where unusual thinking styles are very helpful for creativity. I've studied teams. I've studied leadership. I've studied how you put organizations together. I've even worked with governments on how to do audits in governments to make them more creative and innovative. And I write these things and I put them into scientific papers that nobody ever reads. <laughs> Which is why I also have lots of fun coming out of university and actually helping people and talking to people like yourself. So I've helped coach leaders as they develop and grow their business. I've helped put together really creative teams. Anyone heard of the program X Factor? Yeah, I put together that team. I did all the psychological profiling for that on the basis of my research. I've helped with leaders. I put teams together. I've done culture change programs. I can't say too much about Channel 4 because that's one of my main slides in a bit. And I even helped the government of Dubai with their Emirates Mars mission and helped get their first Arabic nation into space. Well, I think we can probably all agree that that's more than enough about talking about me. So let's move over to what we're hopefully going to achieve for today. So I've already told you this. I hope you're going to learn something that's useful for you. How to use your brain better to be more creative and innovative. I also want to share with you some thoughts about how to lead a team, how to grow a team, and some tools and techniques to get better ideas out of your team. And lastly, if you can apply some of these thoughts about yourself and your team, I'm pretty certain it will help your business to grow. In my day job, I work a lot in Cheshire and Lancashire and other parts of the north of England, helping entrepreneurs and small businesses to grow using many of the same tools and techniques. So I hope you'll find them useful. But if they are not, if you have a question, if something doesn't make very much sense, which is entirely possible because I usually talk far too quickly, please feel free to put your hand up and ask a question. I really want to encourage some debate and some conversation amongst us. And that starts now. In your tables, two minutes, two words on the screen. What do these words mean to you? The good news is there's no right answer. Nobody owns how to define creativity and innovation. But there is a take home point, something useful about that, but I'll tell you afterwards. So two minutes in your tables, interactive discussions, and I'll come and get some thoughts off different tables. What does creativity and innovation mean to you? Make sense? Right, you all said hello, start working. <laughs> Okay, chaps, let's stop there. I'm so sorry. I know some of you are still talking and it's quite frustrating because you want to get to the right answer. But I told you at the beginning, there isn't really a right or a wrong answer. So back in the room, everyone back in the room. Thank you very much. Out of your conversations. I'll be saying that a lot. The only way this is going to work is if you go into tables and I say back in the room, you kind of need to stop talking. Otherwise, I'll be even more lazy and I'll say nothing because you'll just talk. But we don't want to do that, do we? So I'm holding a microphone, probably going to run around. Have we got a second mic possibly on the go to give me a hand if anyone uh, asks a question? But while I'm over this way, can I please have a starter for 10? Someone give me some words about how they defined what they mean by creativity. Let me come over to this table. Let me pass you the mic, please. Yeah, so apparently we have agreed on um, that creativity is uh, finding a solution to a problem in the easiest way. And innovation is building and finding a unique way of approaching a problem. And a unique way of approaching a problem. Thank you very much for that starting point. I'm going to come over to this table. Something similar? Anything different? Um, I'll pass you the mic. Thank you. Joining unfamiliar dots. Whoa, you can come again. So one of my key principles I'll talk about in a moment is making connections between the dots. So that's what I would say very much around creativity. What about this table for innovation? What did you guys say what innovation was? They were listening us. <laughs> yeah, so apparently innovation is copying the other table because <laughs> this table over here just said what this table just said. The intellectual property belongs to us. Go on, go on. The intellectual property belongs to us. The intellectual property belongs to you. 
So <laughs> innovations and creativity is something that uh, you identify the problems first, see the crisis in a different way, yes. and then innovate or something, you find a solutions around it, which others cannot see even. Nice. So people will see that there is... Finding, the, finding opportunity in that, you Some know. Good words in there. When I think about words like new ideas, opportunity, seeing problems, fixing problems, I think we can probably start to hear and see why being creative and innovative is very, very important for startups. It's very important for scaling. It's very important for entrepreneurs. I'm sorry if I haven't had a chance to come around your table yet, but there's lots of other opportunities for other conversation pieces where I'll come and pick on your table later. So let's start off with some definitions. I'm a bit of a scientist, so I would do this, but I'll explain there is a take home point. Creativity is about developing ideas, coming up with ideas. Creativity is about coming up with ideas so you can solve a problem or exploit an opportunity. And I bet we've all got problems and we've all got opportunities and our customers or our service users have all got problems and opportunities. I'm going to have to put the mic down in a second because I need to do some body language here. This is kind of important as I get to my take home point. So sorry if you're going to go a bit quiet, but here we go. I'll go up here. So moving around so hopefully you guys can still see me and hear me. Creativity has this shape. We start with a problem, an opportunity, an issue, an angry customer, a new technology, and we develop ideas by diverging and thinking outwards. We create lots and lots of options and ideas. Not one idea, but lots and lots of options and ideas. This is the shape of creativity. So I'll do this a lot. I've got my clicker. I forgot. I don't need that. I've got buttons here, but never mind. I'm not, I'm not, I think I've been doing this talking stuff for a while, but never mind. So if that's creativity, this bit, innovation is I've now got lots of options and ideas. Which ones do I get to the point where I apply them and use them so I can make a new and useful product or service or way of working or concept? Now, you've probably already worked out what my take home point is, because if creativity has this shape and innovation has this shape, they don't like happening at the same time. Creativity and innovation from a psychological background, which is my, my background, are different. Don't try and have all the ideas at the same time as working out which ones work. Now, many people are not taught how to do this. And if that's the only thing that you remember, go wild, have lots of ideas, then get serious and work out what works afterwards. Your creative approach will improve. So don't try and do both the ideas and the evaluation and making sense out of those ideas at the same time. And most of the tools and the techniques and the brainstorming things that we might use are about helping us to do that. As a leader, if your team is sat around you, two, three, four, ten people, your job is to explain, guys, we're here. I want some ideas. And if the team starts going, that won't work, oh, we haven't got enough time, then you know that they're not in this zone and we need to wait a little bit before we start thinking about being critical and evaluative. So that's my first take home point. Don't try and be creative and innovative at the same time. Separate the two processes. I could even go so far as to explain someone like IBM Consulting, if you were to buy their services, they would give you two teams, an ideas team who developed the concept and a project management team who would then deliver the concept. So even this is baked into how we do our consulting. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are there any quick questions? Good, let's move on. So uh, moving on to some of the key information, predominantly about you now, and I've got some key principles, some key understandings of what drives and boosts creativity in you, in teams, and in your businesses. Now, the first of my key principles I call connections, and I like calling it connections. I'm going to do this once. There is a scientific name for this principle. Just get ready. It's called the Blind Variation Selective Retention Combinatorial Model. Shall I say that again? The Blind Variation Selective, Com Selective Retention Combinatorial Model, or, in my words, connecting and mashing up ideas in your brain. The creative process, when you have a problem to solve, when you want to come up with a new idea, 
you reach into your brain, you start to take your knowledge and your experience and your memories, and you start to mash them together. You're making connections between ideas in your brain. And it doesn't matter if you're young or old, whether you're male or female, it's all the same. Whether you're an engineer or in marketing, it doesn't make any difference. The creative process is joining ideas together. Right, that's the easy bit, but I'm gonna try and do an audience game with you now. We're gonna play an interactive game where I'm gonna shout out a word, and I want everybody in the room to shout out the first word they can think of. And I'm going to explain what this is in a minute and how this works. Before I do that, actually, I've forgotten. I've got myself excited. Let me actually do an example of connecting together two ideas first. So I'm going to go over here so I've got my hands free. Creativity and an idea is about connecting two things together. Here's some examples. You guys should hopefully see me. In this hand, I have got a Sony Walkman, old style Sony Walkman. In this hand, I've got a computer hard disk drive. Both things already existed. But when we connect together the two existing ideas, Sony Walkman, computer hard disk drive, what did we create? Oh, the Zen Media Player is the first one. Now, the service innovation that Apple brought along with the iTunes stores gave both a technological advance and also a nice hub that we could use. Here's another example, and especially if you're probably, um, if you bought this kind of product recently in Britain, you've probably seen this. I have got in this hand a vacuum cleaner. Most of you know the answer already. He's nodding. He knows the answer already. I've got a vacuum cleaner in this hand. And in this hand, I have got the processes used in a factory to remove small bits of wood when you're chopping up wood. Vacuum cleaner, the processes of a cyclone within a foundry for chopping up wood in a wood mill. If I combine the two existing technologies together, what did we just invent? It is the Dyson vacuum cleaner. I do one other one. This is three things now. I have got an old lamp, a light, a lamp. I have a sewing machine like our grandparents used to use where you actually have to turn the handle for a sewing machine. And I've got film from a camera. Light, sewing machine, film from a camera. Come on, I thought you had it. Someone shout out, what, is that, what did I just invent by connecting three things that are already existing? Light, sewing machine, film from a camera. Who said that? That's the man over there. <laughs> Check that out. Yes, that is exactly the right answer. It was the Lumiere brothers' first ever cinema projector was taking three things that are already existing, but smashing them together. Now I'm going to get back to the point I was about to make. Now we're going to do the word association game because your brain and my brain is lazy. When we make connections and put ideas together, your first connections are usually rubbish. They're not very original. We always think of the obvious thing. So we're now going to play this game to prove that that's kind of how our brain works. So I'm going to shout out a word. I want you to shout out the first word that you think of. Does that make sense? Mm, I'm not getting much loudness back, suggesting that when I... There we go, because if I actually do this, it's going to be me on my own. I'm looking at the Innovator International team as well. You're in this as well. Oh, he's gone. But if he was there, I want him to shout out as well. He's over there. Right, you can shout. Right, so I say a word, you shout out the first word that comes into your mind. I say black, you say white. See, we all just jump to the right answer. I say dog, you say I say knife, you say I say innovation, you say I'm going, my work here is done. <laughs> Can you see how your brain knows the right answer? That's your brain lazily connecting ideas together. If you want to be more creative, if you want your team to be more creative, don't stop with your first idea. Your first idea is your brain being lazy. Keep going. And all the science suggests that you actually have your best ideas seven, eight, 10, 12 minutes after your first idea. But often when we brainstorm, we have a good idea and it's like, go, go, go. Slow down sometimes. Don't stop with your first idea. This is the neuroscience of what drives your creativity. Make better connections. Does that make sense? Right, moving on. So we've done the neuroscience, but that's in here, like literally a tiny, tiny space. But what about all of this? The, the larger space that we spend our time in, the environment, into your tables for a minute or two. If you wanted to be creative, where would you go? 
what kind of place would help you be more creative? So moving from the brain to the outside world. Into your tables, one minute. Where would you go to be more creative? The Barbican's a good answer. <laughs> Okay, I know there's still so many things that people want to share, but I've been spying on you and listening, and there's some really interesting ideas already. So back in the room, sorry for talking over the top of you, I was spying on this table, and they had some really interesting things to taste. I'm going to hand you the microphone, because I'd like you to tell me what you just said. So, tell everybody. I was between going to the nature, something more common, or going to a cafe, because in my case, I love eating sweet things, so when I'm eating a cake or something, I feel like I can... I can really focus nice. and I feel more creative too. Marvellous. <laughs> and you obviously exercise a lot as well because if you eat that much cake, you're doing very well. <laughs> I, you need to tell me you're like personal trainer at some point. Um, this table over here, um, where would you go to be creative? What encourages you to be more creative and innovative? Who's going to speak up? Go if, on. You are, if you are stay with the six beautiful girls, you then... I'll let you say that one. It's International <laughs> Women's Day. <laughs> no, yeah. We decided to say bathroom. The bathroom? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get to that one in a minute, but that came a little bit faster than I was expecting. This is clearly a safe environment where people feel very comfortable to share their ideas, isn't it? How many people have got a great idea when you're in the shower? Quite. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to come over to this table and the cameraman's going to get angry with me because I'm not supposed to go that far, but I'm going to do it anyway. This table over here, perhaps tell me, where would you go to be creative and innovative? Shower. Go on, tell me. Shower is our best choice. Shower is yeah. the best choice. Yeah. So there's lots of different answers, and I've heard different people saying different things. Sometimes on this table, someone said, when I want to think carefully, I go somewhere quiet, really quiet, and shut myself away. But maybe if I want to get loads of ideas out and be really stimulated, I go and sit in a noisy cafe. Maybe I want to go outside, go for a walk. So I've actually done some science and some research into this area. And I'm going to share with you one of my latest papers. I think what we're like is often like a goldfish in a bowl. We ignore the water. We don't realise the water is just as important as all the other things out there. And sometimes we don't pick the right environment. But we should perhaps be more deliberate in what we do. Now, I don't expect anyone to read this. That's probably a stupid idea. It is too many words. Just read the title and just be impressed that basically it's a scientific journal. That's the only reason I put this up here. Here is a study that I wrote that nobody else read. So I'm going to force you to find out about it. I found, and lots of people have found, that exposure to nature makes us more creative. Going for a walk outside, having a plant pot on your desk, even having a screensaver on your laptop, which is na natural, will help you be a bit more creative. So what's the take home point? Don't always do your brainstorming in the same place. Don't always have your team in the same environment. Get them out. Go and wander around, use different facilities, sit in a cafe. I said I did a lot of work with Channel 4, a quite famous international film and TV company. They used to change all of their meetings some would meet at the back of a bus. Some would meet in a museum. Some people would meet in the middle of Regent's Park, obviously not in the winter. But the idea being, don't just do all of your work in a different place. Choose carefully how your brain makes connections, but also choose carefully the environment that we want to try and work within. OK. So we've talked about neuroscience, connections. Don't stop with your first idea but also the environment we find ourselves in is really, really important as well. Choose it carefully. And that was a bit more about you and leading for your teams. I'm now going to start diving into specifically some more information about teams. And I've got three things I want to share with you. And on the last bullet point is where I stop talking mainly and get you to do stuff. Tools and techniques. But before we get there, a little bit about culture, climate, how do you lead a team to encourage them to be more creative and innovative? Then we'll talk about how to grow your team with some simple principles and then into those tools and techniques if I haven't run out of time. So time for another principle. The second principle, the first principle is called connections. The second principle is called chain reactions. Now here I'm expressing a chain reaction like a domino effect. And this is about what it feels like to be, ooh, I pushed a button by accident. 
This is what it feels like to be in a group where there is an explosion or a domino effect of ideas. Someone says something and it makes you think differently and then around the table we feel this explosion of ideas. If you're a scientist and engineering background, it's, a, it's actually a chain reaction, the degradation of uranium-235, but we'll not go into that. Has everybody been in a group or been in a team where you can feel the power, the explosions of creativity, all of that inspiration? Some people are nodding, I hope so. But probably the truth is, often our teams are not very like that. So I have another exercise for you about the chain reactions principle. And here what I'm going to ask you is to do something in reverse. In your opinion, what kills creativity in a conversation? What stops creativity in a team? Things that people say, things that people do. I'm going to give you about four minutes and I'll come around every table or try, make sure I do that, every table and get one example for each. Our take home point, because it's quite simple, is all the things that we just say, don't do that. It's not very complicated. It's not very rocket science, this one. So are you ready? Into your tables, what have you seen people say and do that kills creativity in a conversation? You have four minutes, go. Okay, that's four minutes, that passed pretty quickly. So back into the room. We're gonna do this one slightly differently. I'm not gonna hand the microphone over because I want to keep the momentum going and it's gonna slow down. So I'm gonna come to each table, one idea per table. If you've already heard it, we'll just try and pick another one. Let's get one idea per table as I start at this end and make my way over. Shout out what kills creativity in a conversation. <laughs> Guys, back in the room. Thank you. Comfort zone and uh, uh, they don't want to risk losing something they do have. People get stuck in their comfort zone. They don't want to take a risk of getting out of their comfort zone and maybe losing something. This table. Pessimistic. Ooh, pessimistic. What might that sound like in a meeting? What would somebody say to be pessimistic? That's not, that's not right, that's not correct. This table. People in general kill creativity. <laughs> Go on, say a bit more. People kill creativity. They also drive it as well, so what is it they do to kill it? Judgment. Judgment, what might they say? That's a bad idea. That, who had the phrase around your table, that'll never work? Probably that's the kind of phrase. I'm gonna, I'll say a little bit more of that in a moment. I'll come over to this table over here, so give me a shout something out. Limits. Sorry? Limits. Say a bit more about limits. What do you mean by limits? Well, uh, when, you are, when you are coming with creative ideas so, and you are thinking you know, out of the box, you know, without the limits, then uh, it could inspire creativity. But if some, somehow your colleagues will tell you, oh, it's never, it's never a work. So okay. So the limit, we push too far. It's a really crazy idea when someone says, yeah, well, that's fun in a brainstorming session, but that's never going to work in real life. This table over here. Um, lack of respect or communication skills, knowledge. Yeah, lack of respect. So just like not having been very respectful. Who wants to share an idea and maybe sound a bit silly when you think people might laugh at you yeah. or take, take the mickey out of you? They do have idea, but they don't have the skill, communication skills to express it. Yeah. They have the idea, but they don't have the skills to express it. This table over here. It's getting harder as I make my way along. Hopefully we're not going to get squeaking as well. Ooh, we had body language. So eye rolling, that's about what other body language, as everyone gets really awkward, what other body language kills creativity in a meeting? Huffing, Huffing arms crossed. Another good one is someone's in the middle of talking and you casually look at your watch. <laughs> someone's in the middle of what talking, you say whatever, I'll just send a text message. Happens all over the place. So it's quite difficult to have chain reactions if we're not all paying attention and if we're giving negative body language. Even worse, if you're the boss and you're the one crossing your arms or tutting, you have an even worse impact on everybody else. I'm coming over to this table over here. What else have we got? What else kills creativity? Shame and fear. Shame and fear. Fear of what? Failure. Fear of failure, fear of being laughed at. And we know that if you want really good chain reactions, you want really good ideas, sometimes that silly ideas are what make somebody else say something really sensible. So if you kill the silly ideas, usually our chain reactions are nowhere near as powerful. Thank you, these two. I've got two more. It's getting harder and harder, and I know I've come too far. I won't walk too much further. <laughs> this table over here, what else kills creativity in a conversation? Uh, Self-doubt. 
Self-doubt, that's very, that's very nuanced and rather clever, that one. If you don't even say it and you keep the idea locked in your brain, you can't make a connection with somebody else. That's a really powerful one. I've said it enough, but already last but not least, is there anything left? Go on. What else kills creativity in a conversation? We, we said when somebody says, how are we going to do that? How are we going to do it? And maybe I would argue really at the beginning of the process. So let's have a few take homes about this and let's think, think about what this actually means. Run past the thingy. What we say, what we do, even our body can impact and change all the people around us and whether they feel safe to make good connections and then share those connections with one another. So as a leader, it's our job to set the right environment and to encourage people to feel safe to share their ideas with one another. Next, some people who train creativity will say there should never be any judgment. There should never be any seriousness in creativity. They're idiots. Don't listen to those people. Otherwise, you take silly ideas and you don't criticize them. I should have already know that you should hopefully know the answer to this. I'm going to try this out. When is the best time to start being critical about ideas in the creative and the innovative process? When should we go, we can't afford it, it will never work, the finance budget won't fold, and we don't have the technology? When is the right time to say these things? Show me with your hands. There we go. It's at the end of the process. And as a knowledgeable leader, full of wisdom, you probably know when you're working with people, they start speaking and you know it's not going to work. You know it. But just zip, zip, just one minute, let them speak. Thank you. That's a thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that idea. I, know that I really appreciate that. However, let me, we'll come back to that one later. And in, in, an, in an hour's time, then we can explain all the reasons why it maybe isn't a good idea. Don't do it at the beginning, which is what everybody does and kills the creativity. So our main take home points are don't do the things we just said and recognize the shape of the creative process will guide us. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I've got one thing as an, as I guess, as a, 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 a reminder, basically on the next slide, don't be like this. <laughs> so if you've seen Gordon Ramsay, he's got quite a lot of famous TV shows. Gordon Ramsay, the chef is the opposite of how we want to encourage people to feel safe, to have good ideas. What are you? I'm an idiot sandwich. Don't be that boss. Okay, so we've now talked about teams. Now we'll talk about growing your team. Because I'm guessing, put your hands around the room, who wants to grow their team in the next six months? Thought so. Who wants to shrink their team in the next six months? Yeah, I didn't think so. So we've all got this challenge. We all want to grow our teams. And there's a few things that we might think about as we do that. Back to another bit of science and a bit more of a principle. The main principle understanding about how to grow your team is to use the strength of diversity in all its different forms. People who think differently, people who feel differently, people who've got different knowledge and skills. Because if we're all the same and we're sat around the table, when we talk to one another, I can't make a chain reaction in you because you already think like me. But if the person sat opposite me is rather different, we can spark off one another. And here's a tip, and this is a tip I'll tell you led to something quite famous afterwards if I get to show off. But here's how I think a good way of making it work. I call them chalk and cheese partners. Someone who is soft and squidgy like cheese and someone who's hard and crusty like a piece of chalk i.e. people who are completely different. Two people put together in a pair, just two people, and give them the space and freedom to spark ideas off one another. Chalk and cheese partners. Now, I use this approach with Channel 4 to create quite a famous TV programme. Has anyone come across the TV programme Gogglebox? Some of us, not everyone. Gogglebox was created, as I'll show you in a moment, from two people who never, ever normally worked together. Here's where all the words are probably going to come up far too small. I have to go and stand in front of the screen or I can't read them myself. So this is an interview with Jay Hunt. Uh, she was the chief creative officer uh, for Channel 4. And as she says, I'm, she talks about me here. Uh, I teach creativity. I've got a useful phrase. 
different people help different people to think differently. And they work with me to help work out how to get their different people to spark ideas off one another in chalk and cheese pairs. And here's the example. She says, it's the very madness of different ideas connecting and colliding that leads to hit TV shows. Some of our most successful shows came from unexpected places. The science and the history team develop Gogglebox. That's not their job. They don't do that kind of stuff. The comedy team put together and commissioned Black Mirror. And you won't have seen it, but the team who normally does documentaries made a crazy show where people try to ski down the side of a, of a hill and then jump, ski jumping, if you come from that background. They cancelled that show because it was a good idea, but it nearly killed everybody. So that wasn't a very good idea. So, you know, crazy ideas sometimes work, not always. So as they say, we don't think we're the experts, but we think that we create our ideas using our people who understand who we are and what our values are. And I can tell you, before we started this programme, Channel 4 had not won an award in many, many years. It had less and less audiences. Its viewing figures were going down. And if you haven't got viewers, you don't sell advertising. And that's what keeps TV pro channels going. Within 18 months of this programme, we'd developed and led a range of world-leading shows. And Channel 4 won the channel of the year um, for all the British TV channels. I say we really think it was the changes to the culture, to the leadership, and getting different people in diverse partners to work together. In terms of if you haven't seen the show, uh, it's quite an interesting idea. You watch people who are watching TV. It's unusual. But one of the most syndicated and successful shows on, in the history of television, syndicated across 15 different countries. And if you haven't seen it, somewhat scarily, this amazing programme that's now on Netflix, which started on Channel 4, Black Mirror, so it all started out of this process of chalk and cheese diverse pairs. So my question, who's yours? Who is the chalk to your cheese? Who is the cat to your dog? What is it that's different? Who do you find to talk to? Maybe it's your partner who isn't in the business. Maybe the partner that you work with in the business, one of you's a scientist and one of you's a salesman. That's, that's Rolls and Royce. You heard of Rolls Royce? I think most people have. One of them was a very, very rich man who liked buying cars, and one of them was a really, really clever engineer. They weren't both the same, but together, Hewlett and Packard were two different people. Black and Decker were two different people, and they were actually different. That's what drove their creativity. Find yours. And you don't have to pay for it. Go and have a cup of tea. Go to the cafe and buy someone a slice of cake and run your idea past them. It doesn't have to be a permanent person, and it could be a different person each week or depending on the project that you're working on. But don't work on your own. Try and bounce things off other people. There's also this issue, of course, of growing your team because you need to recruit. Now, many of us have a tendency to recruit people who are just like us because it's comfortable, it feels safe, but don't. Recruit, try and find people who are different to you. People who have different characters. If you are action, 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 Find someone who tends to be a bit slower and likes to think. If you are all big picture and all the strategy, find someone who likes the small details. If you like doing all the talking, find somebody who doesn't mind being very quiet and doing all the work in the background. I think you get the principle. Com it's not just about characters, but it's about skills. If you're an engineer, make sure the next person's a marketer. If you're in marketing, make sure the next person who comes along is in a complementary skill. But the one take home point is don't just hire a little version of you. That's what many entrepreneurs do because it's quick and it's comfortable. And we often just recruit people who are in our phone already. And there's nothing wrong with that. But try and use the principle of diversity like Channel 4. And chances are your team will grow far more powerfully and effectively than if we make everybody the same. Right, this is where I nearly stop talking and I hand over to you guys and start sharing with you some tools and techniques as I nervously look at the time. I think we're doing okay. I'm also conscious, thinking about it in a practical setting, is around about an hour ago you all ate a lot of food and drank quite a lot of tea and coffee. Just looking around the room, do we need a quick two-minute comfort break? Is everyone comfortable? Okay? 
What I would say is in this next section, when we start doing some tools and some techniques and some brainstorming, if you need to disappear to go and use the toilet, now would be a good time in a moment. So I don't want everyone just to sit here for two hours getting really uncomfortable. So on to techniques and tools and how to do brainstorming better with your team, for which I need to introduce my fifth key principle, which is not follow the yellow brick road, but to follow the creative process. We, and I mean scientists of creativity and innovation, have been studying how people have good ideas for really quite a long time. Over 120 years of studying what leads to good creative ideas. And I will argue as I take us through uh, this model um, that we go through a cycle because it's a process of developing ideas. I will start in the top right. I will start in this one. Oh, that doesn't work, does it? Never mind. I will start in my top right where it says accumulation, and I will make my way around the circle and explain the creative process. And as I've already said, it basically looks a bit like this, going outwards and then coming up with an idea. But I've put it in a circle, so I probably should find a way of putting those two things together. So where do we start? Accumulation. Good brainstorming doesn't actually start with ideas, funnily enough. Really good brainstormers identify the problem carefully. They identify the opportunity carefully. They don't jump straight into brainstorming. So our starting point should be gathering insight and wisdom. What's going on? What do customers want? Why are the products being returned? How could we use this new technology? So our first starting point is not brainstorming, but understanding and gathering knowledge. And I can now link this to my first principle, because if you start learning and reading and reading and learning and talking to people, you're putting stuff in your brain, and the stuff in your brain is what you make connections out of. So you haven't read anything, and you haven't learned anything, you've got nothing to do the creative thinking with. So start with gathering insight before you brainstorm. What's going on? Why are we here? Who should we be working with? And so on. Next, round to the bottom the traditional zone for brainstorming, making or generating new ideas. And here, we're talking about your traditional brainstorming. Everyone sits around a table, shouts out loads of ideas, we write them all down and we try and get as many ideas out as possible. How? What is the best way of coming up with the most ideas possible? Well, I'm going to steal a phrase, I'm going to borrow some words from someone who won two Nobel Prizes. The chat, I think, is the only person who has. A guy called Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes, and he was asked after his second Nobel Prize by the journalist. The journalist said, Linus, they knew one another quite well by this stage. Linus, tell me, how do you have good ideas? And Linus's response was, if I want to have a good idea, I have lots of ideas, and I throw the bad ones away. No magic. No having a bigger brain than anybody else. Yes, he learned a lot, because he needs to learn a lot to make the connections, but he realised that the best way of having as many ideas is to lead the evaluation, the judgement, the seriousness to the very, very end. And he, he was a world-leading scientist. We can apply exactly the same principle. So when you're brainstorming, don't kill the ideas, let as many options out as possible, and then get serious afterwards. Now, you'll also notice that there's a word in the middle of this cycle. Because sometimes when we're going round, we might get insight, come up with an idea, judge it, put it into the market, and it doesn't work. So we have to go back round again. Now let's work out why it didn't work, come up with another idea, evaluate it, and keep going again and again. But in the middle of this process is a really famous word called incubation for creativity scientists. And it's the same word we would use in farming to describe a chicken sitting on top of an egg. The chicken sitting on top of an egg, the egg is incubated. When you sleep on your ideas, when you allow your brain to have an idea in the back of your head, in your non-conscious, you will generally have your best ideas. And we did this earlier, but I'm going to go quickly. We've already heard. Just quickly shout out, put your hands up. Where are you? And what are you doing when you have your best ideas? We've already had the shower as an example over there. Where else? Are, what are you, where are you? And what are you doing when you have your best ideas? Sleeping. Sitting in the Barbican. Nice. <laughs> you can come again. Uh, anyone else? Nick. 
Walking. The dog, I hope. Absolutely. Dogs are a very, very important aspect of how to have good ideas. Someone else, where do you get your best ideas from? Traveling. Traveling. Having a drink. Where else? In the bath. Have you noticed when no one has said where you've had your best ideas, which I find slightly scary considering how much money we pay for all this stuff? When you do your meditation, I, when I work a lot across the Middle East, people tell me but by looking slightly bashful and slightly embarrassed, they say I have my best ideas when I'm praying. I think maybe that's how God maybe works through us. But, however, none of us have said in the office, staring at Word, staring at PowerPoint, looking at that Excel spreadsheet, hmm, so there's a lady, as has been mentioned already, there's a lady who studied best ideas and she said what it's called is the bed, bath, bus syndrome. Most of us will have our best ideas in bed, waking up, falling asleep, some people even dream the solutions to their big problems. In the bath, in the shower, now we've all got this far, there's a very famous place in the bathroom where most people have some of their best ideas. Anyone prepared to say it out loud? On the toilet, no one ever likes saying it, but it's really, really, really true. Most people have their best ideas on the toilet and on the bus, on the plane, on the train, cycling, walking the dog. You never tend to have your best ideas when you're focusing and working and concentrating hard. And there's a really easy psychological explanation for this. It's about not distracting you. When I'm engaged, I'm busy, I'm driving, I'm, I'm doing something really important. I'm standing here, I'm trying to do a really good presentation. I want to be concentrated and focused. So my brain shuts down the back brain. It just shuts it down and goes, no, 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 you're busy right now, aren't you? You're very busy, I will not interrupt you while you're busy doing something very important. Then you're sat on the toilet and your brain's like, he's not doing anything right now. <laughs> hey, look, look what I've been doing. Look at all these ideas I've been having in the background because you're having a shower and your body, your brain has gone, now is the time to interrupt you. Now let's get to a take home point. Let's get to something you can action and use. It's Sunday morning. You've walked the dog and you've had that brilliant idea of how to unlock a new market. You've had a brilliant idea of how to add a new feature to your product, to your service. It's Sunday morning and you think, oh, on Monday when I get into the office, I'm going to do that. What always happens on Monday morning? Yeah. You forget it. Absolutely, without fail. We know this for a fact. The reason why is that idea is connections very loosely organized of just the right bits of your knowledge and your brain and your experience and the smell of coffee all at the same time. And now you want at nine o'clock on Monday morning to make all those ideas line up again to spark the same idea. Good luck. So what should we be doing differently? It is not complicated. <laughs> Write it down, honestly. And who here actually actively writes down their ideas? Good. That's probably why most of you are actually here, because you've already learned how to do this. But make sure, use your phone. Write stuff down. Send yourself voice notes. And then one thing you're doing when you have these ideas, don't evaluate. Probably tomorrow when you read your note, you'll go, that was a really stupid idea but at least you wrote it down because sometimes it will be the good idea. And I can tell you about Charles Darwin. We studied his diaries and you can see that he this is the very same process that he used to use. And there's a very famous phrase in Darwin's work called the tree of life, which you may have come across. They've analyzed his diaries and they've proven that when he was going around the Galapagos Islands, he wrote down some first ideas and because they can tell the difference of his handwriting and the ink that he used, 37 years later, he went back to his notes and he scribbled in the corner a little branching diagram that he wrote, Tree of Life underneath. Now, I'm not suggesting we all need to take 37 years to build on our ideas, but like Charles Darwin, write it down, write it down, write it down, because if you've got it, you might be able to use it. If you didn't write it down, it's probably gone forever. So that's a really key aspect of how to be better as an innovator is make sure you write your ideas down and imagine they're probably going to come when you're relaxed and perhaps not expecting it and might not be prepared. Does that make sense? In terms of follow the process, what's going on, generate ideas, shut them down, try and sleep on it while you can. Okay, so just quickly, I have told you a great deal, so I'm trying to capture the main take-home points, probably with words that are a little bit too small. Number one, 
Don't be creative and innovative at the same time. Ideas first, sensible afterwards. Number two, keep making connections. Don't stop with your first idea. Number three, don't be like the goldfish. Choose the right place, because otherwise you don't even realize the water is around you. Number four, build a safe climate. Encourage people to keep sparking ideas off one another. Don't be that person who tuts and rolls their eyes and crosses their arms and looks all bad or goes, that will never work, far too quickly. Fifth, find someone different to work with, to spark your ideas off. Find the chalk to your cheese. As you grow, keep thinking about diversity or you'll just find more people who think and act and feel just like you. And lastly, follow that creative process. Don't just jump to the ideas. Don't just jump to action. Make sure you identify work, what's going on, all your ideas, then shut them down. That's pretty much everything I hope we said. Hopefully some of that has stuck with you. Time to keep pushing on, I think, in terms of our, our final stretch and onto some tools. So this is where it's going. I think, Richard, you put in one of your posts that I'm a sort of a, an architect of chaos. Well, here we go. This is the bit where all that I've got slides and I'm in control is going to fall away and I'm going to put my trust in you and I'm going to try and teach you some tools quite quickly and you're going to do your best to try and use them. But I want each table to pick a really simple everyday product that hasn't been innovated on very much in the last few years. So don't pick an iPhone. It's really hard to make an iPhone already better. They've been doing that for years. Pick something boring, like a cup. It's amazing when I do this exercise all over the world. And the more boring the thing, the easier it is to use the tool and the more you'll get out of it. So let's give you one minute in each table. Discuss what could you be innovative about that you could all have some fun without getting too serious about. An everyday simple product that we could work on. You've got one minute in your tables, have a discussion, and then we'll, I'll come down and see what kind of things people have got. One minute, off you go. So, just to prove that this is doable, these guys knew nothing about this, because I like to keep them on their toes. They were given no warning whatsoever, no briefing whatsoever. We've just, in the last 10 seconds, have agreed that we're going to do it on a pencil. We're going to talk about a pencil. But our tool that we're going to do, first of all, is called reverse brainstorming. We're going to do everything in the opposite. I want you to try and come up with, in a second, all the ways that you would make your product the worst it could possibly be. So we're going to do a pencil, and we're going to share some ideas to show you the kind of idea. So, Nick, what would make a terrible pencil? I would make it out of jelly. So a pencil made out of jelly. Doesn't write. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You lose it all the time. That would be my one. What else have we got? Um, there's no lead in it. There's no lead. It runs out of lead. Yeah. So it runs out of lead. It hurts my fingers. It's the size of a building. <laughs> Get this guy. Come on, come on, here we go. Um, it breaks every time you use it. It breaks every time you use it. It costs one million dollars. I think you've got the principle, you get it, right? Over to you guys, let me look at my timings. Let's spend about 10 minutes or so. If you run out of steam, then that's okay, but really take your time. Think of as many ways as possible of how you would make your product as bad as possible. Write it all down. Remember, if you don't write it down, you lose it. And then we'll, I'll give you what to do afterwards. Can I have a warm th uh, thanks and applause for my two wonderful assistants? Thank you very much. So you guys have got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. How are you going to kill your product? All right, that sounded like we're having a lot of fun, which is always a good indicator. Teams that are laughing and joking will almost always produce more and better ideas that teams are serious. And there's some science behind that because when you are feeling threatened and you're, not, and you're serious, your attention gets narrower and narrower. But when you're laughing and you feel really relaxed, your attention gets wider and you make wider connections and will come up with better ideas. So as a leader, encourage the laughter. Just for a bit of fun, just to see how people have got some stuff, what insights people have got. Guys, you were working on paper. Can you share one of the more terrible ideas that you came up with? Uh, toxic paper. Toxic paper. I think you guys were doing the school, weren't you? So what were some of the things that we might not want in a school? What's your favourite one? Or one of your favourites? No child will leave the school knowing more than when they arrive. 
No child will leave this school knowing more than when they arrived. I mean, that sort of pretty much encapsulates Michael Gove's education system. But I didn't say that out loud. Um, now, where are we? This table over here, you guys are doing... Spoon. spoon, the humble spoon. What is one of the worst ideas for a spoon? Uh, one that was impossible to clean. An, un an uncleanable spoon. <laughs> I said, I'm not doing every table. Let me come all the way over this way. This guy, this group over here, what are you guys doing? Umbrella. The umbrella. What's one of the worst ideas you can think of for an umbrella? It has holes. It has holes all the way through it. <laughs> so, you know, I said the creative process, don't start with brainstorming. What we've actually tried to do is get insight. This process has helped us understand, like, why would somebody want this thing? Why would they not? Now we can start generating the ideas to fix it. So we're just going to go back to normal, ordinary brainstorming now. Look at all the things you come up with. What are the big ideas that would make it better then? You've got all the ideas of what would make it terrible. Now let's flip it on its head. It's traditional brainstorming. I want a big long list of all the cool things that you could put into your product. Make sense? Can you give about six minutes? Because it will be as fast as this one. Six minutes. Capture as many big ideas as you can to make your product better. We're in the innovation and solution mode now. Well, that's our time up. I can tell you I work with people in the military and I work with submariners, the people in submarines. When I play that sound, they all just die because that's the same sound for action stations in a submarine. It's really funny, but I keep it anyway. Anyway, so we've been doing some brainstorming all about the good ideas now, and I've heard lots and lots of interesting ones. Just going to quickly run around to some of the tables I perhaps didn't speak to. This table over here, what's some of the best features for your kettle that you quite like? What we got? It knows what you want to drink. It knows what you want to drink, and when you pour out the kettle, it's just got chamomile tea in it, or it's got coffee, it just does it straight away. I want that kettle. This group over here, what have we got? Some of your best ideas? Wow, a pen that knows when you're making grammar mistakes or spelling mistakes. That's really, everyone's gone, ooh, that's a good idea. We like that one, don't we? Oh, we like it. We've got a product. We've got a product. So over to Umbrella, to umbrella Station. What have we got, guys? Here we have like two. Yep. A jacket that turns into umbrella. A jacket that turns into umbrella. A jacket that turns into an umbrella. Oh, look at you. You, you can't see the faces behind me. Go on, what's the second one? Then rent an umbrella. Rent an umbrella. Station, rent an umbrella. Rent an umbrella. So you don't have to carry it around all the time, but it'll get raining. You just rent it for an hour, and then you don't have to carry this wet head. Brilliant. Where do I <laughs> sign up? Uh, last but not least, let's have someone from this table. What else have we got? Have we done this, ta have we done this table already? Yeah. I did. Uh, this table here. Because these, these, were, these guys were laughing a lot. What have we got? We have a hairbrush. A hairbrush. That styles your hair and even releases shampoo, conditioner, that kind of stuff. A hairbrush that styles your hair while you're using it and then releases like dry shampoo or yeah. conditioner if you need it, if your hair needs a bit of a boof, a boofunting. Never have a bad hair day. And the tagline is? Never have a bad hair day. Can we just have a quick round of applause <laughs> for everybody, I think, in the room? <laughs> So as we know, we're learning these tools so we can apply them next week. So hopefully, you might do some reverse brainstorming to understand what the holes or the problems might be in your product. You might do some brainstorming to come up with some good options. But as I said in the creative process, if we've been doing it properly, we get to this point. We've now got more options than we know what to do with. We've been doing it properly. We've got loads of ideas, but we didn't criticize any of them and there was no evaluation. But now we need to know how to move forward. I've got a tool that we can quickly apply to start to rapidly choose and select our ideas. And it is called dot voting. Has anyone come across dot voting before? It's not my tool. They use it in NASA. I was taught it by a NASA engineer. And they call it the dot democracy in NASA. But I stole the same concept. Here's how it works. Can I have my two lovely assistants again? <laughs> Here's some ideas we came up with earlier, all of them bad because I did them on my own. So our pencil, it has a comfy grip. It has endless lead, it never runs out of lead. It changes color with your mood, the writing of the pencil changes color with your mood, and the end tastes like sweets. 
That's for you, that one. I deliberately designed that one for you. <laughs> so what are we going to do? We've got, if your sheets of paper, there's more and more and more. I've just got some quick ones here. We now need to choose. Here's where evaluation goes horribly wrong. Someone often says, uh, the leader, the lead facilitator is like, oh, endless lead. Well, that won't work. Whose idea was that? And now all of a sudden, someone has to put their hand up and we've taken a psychologically safe place where everyone feels awesome and now we're starting to point the finger of blame at people. What I like about my technique or the technique of dot voting is we only focus on the positives. What do we do? Each of us grabs a pen. One for you. One for you. We choose a criteria for today, the best new and useful idea as we see it as a team. And then you choose the number of votes. I'm going to say three each. How do you vote? Well, I really like the sweet ones, so I'm going to vote three times with three dots for the sweetie pen. Guys, you vote. What would you spread your three votes out on? Do it at the same time. Yeah, do it at the same time. That's what I love about this tool. It's so efficient. Well, you can do that too. We can both like the same idea. I think this is a whole thing, though, because it depends. I don't know if I'm going to be done a little bit here. No, do. <laughs> do. Does it depend upon why you want the pencil? Because if I want the pencil to be functional, I want it to have a comfy grip and endless lead. Yeah. But on the other hand, I want a pencil that tastes nice. Yeah. So where does that criteria come in in terms of the functionality? I, the driver. I, I'd be inclined to say that in your good process, you would have defined some of your objectives right at the early stages of what you're trying to achieve to help you choose. For today, to keep life easy, I've said just vote for the best new and useful idea. That's basically my definition of innovation. I still can't believe I'm making my mind up on where to put my dots. He's engaged, people. So looking at the board, and if you can read, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Like where the energy lies in our group is for the sweetie pen. And nobody criticizes. We don't even say, ah, ha, 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 nobody voted for that idea. We just move on. So nobody gets criticized and it's really quick. Everybody, you've got, if you can, if there's one piece of paper in the middle, I'm gonna give you one or two minutes for everybody to vote three times on that piece of paper. What do you like best about the ideas you've got? Go, go, go. Thank you, thank you, my, my assistant. Done, well done everybody. I hope you found that a very quick way of evaluating. It's not perfect. What I would say, you don't just have to copy the votes. If all the votes are in one area, you might look at the voting and you might combine two ideas. It's both a pencil that, that changes color and it's got a suite at the end. So you can combine your ideas, but this technique helps you choose really quickly. Now I've got one more tool to leave you and then we're finished. I'm gonna do this one really quickly. This tool is called 15 by 15, and it's one of my own tools, and I did use this for Channel 4 and other organizations. And as it says at the bottom, it's to help you get to action quickly and cheaply. The principle is, how would you start to test out your idea if you only had 15 pounds and 15 minutes? I'll give you a very quick example of how someone did this to produce an app. 15 pounds, 15 minutes, the app was about Barney the dinosaur, purple dinosaur, the app was for education, to teach children their A, B, C, and their one, two, three. Now you could, as we've already heard, we could spend 20,000 pounds building an app. That's not 15 pounds and 15 minutes and it's quite an expensive way. Here's how they did it for no money. A massive piece of cardboard and they cut a hole in the middle and they put fake buttons on the bottom and then somebody put a dinosaur costume on and then they just danced around in the background and they just tried out what would happen. If I push this button, what does Barney say? If I push this button, what does Barney do? And they worked out what they did and didn't like without spending any money. So I'm gonna give you two minutes in your tables. If you had 15 pounds and 15 minutes, how could you start to bring your ideas to life? Two minutes in your tables, go, and then we're done. Okay, chaps, I think we're probably about there. Has everyone come up with a quick experiment? 15 pounds and 15 minutes. We there? Our best effort anyway. I know I've come too far. So everyone back in the room quickly. Back in the room, we're almost finished. So I'm coming over to this table over here. 
back in the room. Tell me, what, what, what did you come up with your quick experiment to get your idea to come to life? Guys, if we could please focus, 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 focus. Please. Trying again. A programmable chip for drinking water. Manual record it, just to try out the different emotions and show it. Marvellous. This group over here, what did you guys do to bring together your pen idea? Uh, actually, we um, provide a pitch, and it's uh, in 15 minutes, if you can sell it to someone. It's a good idea. So their 15, 15 minute test is try and sell it to someone. If you can't sell it to someone in 15 minutes and no one will buy it, you might as well go home. Makes sense. It doesn't always have to be the product, it could be the, the pitch. I really like that, using that idea. This table over here, 15 pounds and 15 minutes. So we want um, coloring to indicate the temperature of the kettle. Okay. So um, we're gonna have like cardboard that are cut, and then for each temperature range, you have a color yep. that we, you know, maybe crayons or colors that nice. are used there. And then when you see the red color, it tells you that the, the, the kettle is like ready, and then you, you know it's ready and you can go grab it. So if people, depending on the number of people who are aware, then we know that, oh, this is something that people okay. really want to get. So it's a color changing kettle, and instead of producing very, very clever electronics, just use cardboard or a piece of paper that's the right color, and just stick it on the outside and say, well, this is red. What, what, what temperature do you think the kettle is? It's red. And everyone goes, it's cold. You're like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> You try to work out, you know, if it's green, does that mean it's medium? You can just try it out and see what people says. No money, no expense. I love this approach because most of us very quickly focus on spending a huge amount of money to try and do this really quickly. These guys have told me, I can give you a quick example. Around the table, around the tables, who's a bit, a bit of a football fan? I mean, watches football once in a while. Some of you may have come across a famous football boot called the Adidas Predator football boot which came out a fair few years ago. And if you're not a football fan, this is a really boring story, I'm sorry. But it's an Adidas football boot and it's quite clever because it had grippy things on it and you could spin the ball. Do you know where that came from? It's an Australian footballer and football coach was coaching young kids in Australia and saying, when you want to make the ball curve, you have to wrap your foot around the outside of a ball like you're playing table tennis. And one of the kids went, well, that's no good. We haven't got table tennis bats on our feet, have we, Craig? So he went home, got a table tennis bat, ripped off the bit of the table tennis, super glued it on a bat, on his shoe, and put some elastic bands around the outside. That's not even like three pounds. Went outside, started kicking the ball, and that works. Less than 15 pounds, less than 15 minutes. I believe it's the most successful and profitable football boot ever made in all of history, off the back of just tinkering around and playing with stuff and doing it quick and dirty. You don't need to spend £20,000 on an app the first time. If you can make the first mistakes of £15, it's usually a lot better. Now that, I think, especially if I probably lost my clicker, brings us pretty much towards the end of where we're at for here. So a quick review of what we've done for tools. If you want inspiration, don't jump into brainstorming. Do reverse brainstorming. Kill your product and your service first. If you want big ideas, then brainstorming and just shouting ideas around the table is a really powerful technique. If you need to quickly choose because you've got lots of options, maybe get your team to do some dot voting. But as Richard said, be really clear why you are voting and what you are voting for. And lastly, don't spend a fortune. Don't spend lots of money. Make your idea scalable and quickly by spending as little as possible and as quickly as possible before you start to burn through and use all of your resources. That's it. I said I was going to hopefully share with you some principles and ideas for your own brain, some tools, techniques, and leadership approaches for your teams. And if you bring all that together with some of the tools we've learned, I really hope that you will be able to be that little tiny bit more creative and innovative than when you walked in the room and hopefully help you to grow your business. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Thank you very much. So thank you very, very much to Mark and to everyone else for your time. We've still got another hour's worth of networking to go yet. But can I ask, the Innovator International team are not going to be in the room downstairs because they won't give us the best photos. The Innovator International team are all going to be scattered through the forest area. 
Most of us in the middle. So if you want to come grab yourself a coffee, a drink, anything, please do network. But if you can, if you want to do it, search the forest area, meet there, chat there, speak to everyone you need to. That would be absolutely fantastic. So again, thank you so much for all of your time, Nick. Yeah, just just quickly. Um, one of the rules of networking, try and find someone to speak to you haven't spoken to yet. It really does, you'll be surprised at who's in the room and what they're doing. So, you know, spread yourselves around. And, and thanks ever so much for coming along today. It's been absolutely fantastic seeing you all again. Uh, thanks very much. And a last point, can we please have our new associates on the podium quickly? We do have new members in the team. They will be mentors, they will be associates, they will be assessing projects. So if you do want to speak to some of the team, you know, you know Ali, you know Catherine, you know Karen, Nick, myself, James. But we also have, we have Andre, we have Sarah, we have Stephen, we have John as well. So please do introduce yourself to the rest of the team. And we're delighted to be working with these guys, these ladies and gentlemen throughout the next years. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.